Thank you very much. It's good to be here. And I am so used to talking with a PowerPoint. <laughs> but uh, I, I have the images in my head, so I should be fine with that. Because of the work just here and because it's from 1991, I think I'll just start with my whole Scorch story. So in the uh, 80s, I was doing a lot of pastels, portraits on the streets of New York. I lived in an industrial building in Newark where my neighbor made uh, air, con air condition and metal ducts out of galvanized steel. So I collected those strips, that his cutaways, and wove them together to make clothing and things like that. Because in, in high school, my major was fashion design, so I started making metal clothing. But then I got a residency at a student museum in Harlem. Uh, it was officially 89, but it began in 88. And I couldn't carry all my metal to that studio. So I wanted to do something else. So each day, traveling from Newark, New Jersey to Harlem, by train, I would walk down the street. And I saw an iron on the street that had been run over by a car. And I didn't pick it up immediately. You know, I had a big interest in African art. I had a friend who was an African art dealer, almost a neighbor. So from hanging out with him, after about four views of this iron, I began to see it as a Dan mask. So that's the Dan people of Liberia. And suddenly the iron looked like that. So that was a pivotal point for me, almost a magical point, because after that moment, I began to see irons everywhere. And I noticed something about the human mind that makes you see what you want to see. You know, if you, if you step outside and you're thinking about Mercedes, suddenly you'll see a lot of Mercedes. You know, we pretty much attract what we think about. So suddenly irons are everywhere. So the one that was there, the very first one flattened, I brought it into my studio and I took Polaroids of it. There was no digital at that time. So I hung the Polaroids up on the wall and looked at them for months and months and months. And then I discovered a scorch on the floor of my studio. So now I felt I was having like a spiritual thing happening. It was like meant to be kind of thing, you know. And I, I know it sounds funny, but in that moment, I believed it 100%. My studio was a sweatshop. I had been living there for about five years by this time and had never noticed a scorch before. So I decided to surrender to the scorch. And uh, the first thing I did, I made a list of everything the iron reminded me of. So I have a physical iron, it has a black handle, it has a silver bottom. So silver is a precious metal, so that's money. Black handle is black. I went inside and asked about my personal experience with the iron. I remember my great grandmother was a domestic. She ironed Dr. Wynn's clothes all the time. I inherited Dr. Wynn's kids' clothes growing up. So I had now the domestic servant, who was my great grandmother. The origins of domestic servitude in the U.S. for African Americans was slavery, so now I had slavery. Then the iron looked like an African mask. The shape looked like a boat. So I had a whole list of things that I could now speak about using the iron as a symbol that could last forever. And it did, for about 16 years, I only made art out of irons and iron imagery. Because that was also, the 80s was the decade of personal branding. You know, everybody, you're gonna either be a Sassoon or you're gonna be a Gap, T-shirts with logos on them, you know, that all started in the 80s. So being that I'm also a lover of words and language, I love the double entendre of branding myself with a brand that was a brand, Silex, branding physically with a hot iron. So all these things came together in the iron for me. Um, so in my building, there was a courtyard downstairs and uh, I was surrounded, my neighborhood was filled with homeless people as well. So, you know, you learn something from everybody. These homeless guys fire in a can to stay warm. So I said, okay, that's how I heat the iron. So I go out into my courtyard and I start a big fire in the can. I take my irons apart and put them on the handles of ironing boards. So I have a, a barrel filled with branding irons and I just began scorching canvas. This one is called Dance because as I did it, I was like Jackson Pollock, you know, Jack the Dripper is just, you know, dancing, dripping, dripping, dripping. And I was, I was doing the same with the iron. The iron was so hot, I couldn't control it. The iron broke off stuck to the canvas, you know, it, it wasn't planned. So that piece is dance because it was like a dance. Now, also in that same neighborhood, there was a factory that made mattresses. So I needed some mattress padding. I go knock on the door and turns out the woman that works there's brother is an artist who later became a good friend of mine. So they began to give me mattress padding. So both these pieces have mattress padding in the back of them. 
And I haven't seen this in so long, I really had forgotten about that factory. But it really helped the scorch to stay nicely and get this embossing. Um, so it's, it's that kind of story. At the same time, I was very, and maybe America was, involved in the teaching of Joseph Campbell. He was on PBS all the time. So I was reading all his books about comparative religion and mythology. So that became part of the work. So now I discovered that the irons come in various brands. You got the Silex, you got the Black and Deckers, you got Sunbeams. So for me, those are the domestic tribes, okay? <laughs> the domestic tribe concept comes from a speech from Malcolm X. Um, Malcolm speaks about the house Negro and the field Negro. So you probably know the field Negro is the one out in the back picking cotton, the house Negro is the one serving the master. So Malcolm says that uh, if the house burns down, the house Negro works harder to put the fire out than the master because he loves the master so much. So that means the house Negro is the Negro that's doing the chores inside. Probably the one ironing is a house Negro. So this has like several layers. <laughs> I'm trying to get too excited as I say it, but so the layer is that the house Negro is the servant in the house doing the domestic work, doing the ironing, etc. So if by any quirk of time the house Negro decided to revolt, his weapons would be his domestic tools. If the the field Negro may be out back at night pulling out his uh, West African ritual objects. Those are, his, uh, those are his tools. His little wooden carving is his deity, but the house Negro worships his brand, his iron. Don't touch my Silex. We would say that today, you know, like, get away from my Sony. You know, our brands, we, we worship our brands. I can walk in my house and I look around and see Sony's name everywhere. So I'm pretty much worshiping Sony. You know? So the iron became the same thing, and each brand became a tribe, and it represented the people who work with them in the modern world, but in the layer of imagination, I took it back to uh, antebellum or to slave days. So, so that's how this figure would be an icon. I wanted to make the power poses that you see in tr traditional and tribal art. So, and because of the cross, the cross reference with Joseph Campbell, I was also thinking about Greek and Roman things as well, and I thought of, of Atlas. The interesting thing about this piece, this is the only piece where I combine the iron with something other than ironing parts. Every piece after 1991 was made completely out of irons. So it also represents a change in my uh, approach. That, that change came because uh, the community artists that I was involved with all did assemblage. And everybody's work looked alike to me. If everybody can get a tire, an iron, and a, a chair and put something together, it always looks like the same artist. But I decided if I apply a concept of minimalism to that, what I now call minimal maximalism, and take a single object and just multiply that, then I would stand out more. So that's what I did after 91, and that became my, my approach. So the iron itself, you, and this shows some good examples. Two of them together like this become like the slave ship. In some pieces, like here, one standing up like this, when the point is up, becomes a house. But also, if you are Yoruba, or if you've been to West Africa, or if you've been to a, bo a uh, botanica, and you see the little Ilegba figure they have that they sell, it's like a little stone with cowrie shell eyes. This is also that. It's very similar to that. Um, of course, when the point is down, it's a chin, so then it becomes a face. Um, in most of my pieces, the name of the piece, the scorch and the iron are the same brand, so this is actually a silex iron here. These scorches all came from this same iron here. Uh, this one here is a sunbeam. You know? But I like the, the classic irons. You know, nowadays, I call them these sports car irons. They're imported from France, they got plastic bodies, they look, they look like boats. I don't care for those as much. But the 1950s and 60s irons are, are my preferred irons. Um, so I continued with this scorch thing for probably 15 years, maybe from 1988 to 2000. Uh, and it was all because I wanted to brand myself. I wanted to be identified with something. 
I wanted people to see something and always know it was my work.